everyone. I'm Austin. Um, as Peter mentioned, we are the past winners of this time competition. Uh, I'm also a cash prize winner at the Innovation Day. Um, I guess my biggest advice is to take as many opportunities as you can. Um, like just by applying to competitions you know, and then being here, we've gotten a lot of opportunities. Um, I guess without Innovation Day, we actually, when I read the website, we actually weren't a part of the, the categories they're looking for, but we apply anyway and we're very, very grateful. Um, we're hoping to go to Japan in a few weeks and that's a part of it that we've been working on for the past 11 months. Um, yeah, I guess just, just go and give advice to you guys. Uh, you guys are in a great place, by the way. That's the first thing that I was told when I was in your shoes. And some of them was like, just by you being here, you're in a great place to start and scale your business. Mm -hmm. Just by like, the resources that Pace gives everyone. Yeah, I think, uh, from my perspective, at least, the connections that I made to the business plan competition, which is now the Wage Metrics competition, um, were extremely important in really making sure that our business had the foundation that we needed um, to actually get going. So one of our advisors that we got through the business plan competition, the Wage Metrics competition, it was called the business plan competition, <laughs> Uh, is actually on our advisory board of our corporation now. So um, take advantage of all of the people you meet in the best way to really make sure that you can foster those connections because any network that you get from here, what, whoever you network, uh, you also get their network if you have a good connection with that person. So I would say my number one tip is to take advantage of meeting as many people as you possibly can and keeping in touch with those connections. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, like they've mentioned, one of the most valuable things that Pace offers is uh, some the advisors that they have and really industry experts. It's, it's people who have done, I mean, Peter himself is, uh, uh, I would say, a pretty accomplished entrepreneur. You know, he's been through the process that we are currently going through and uh, you guys will hopefully go through um, many times. And they have, they bring in a lot of people who have also been through that same process in different fields especially um, and a lot of the events that they have here that they're able to host who they bring in uh, specific industry experts to help you guys uh, get tips and tricks for how you can uh, really bring your business all the way from an idea to the market oh well I'm uh, actually a pre-medical student so I'm not a part of like the team um, as a business but I participate in the competition um, and honestly, it was a really, really good experience for me, despite the fact that I'm not in, like, in, career-wise, not into business. Um, business is a part of every <coughs> aspect of life, so you know, have to know how to be able to execute and know the steps as far as um, business planning goes. So I think that was really helpful for me. I think one of the biggest questions that we are wondering is like, how do we fill in these holes that we don't know, especially for being in early stage? And we're still in early stage, so we have to constantly ask ourselves these questions. Um, and the biggest thing is to show the judges that like you've thought it through. So one of the big things is like the financial plan, right? Like how, how are you going to project sales in five years if you don't necessarily know how much your product's going to cost, or you haven't made it yet, or you haven't sold it yet? Um, but one of the things they want to see is that you're able to, not necessarily accurately or semi-accurately predicted or that you have it on the dot, but that you're able to look at a market size and then capture and picture how much you intend to capture in that in like some, so many years and then be able to put that on a graph and display it. Um, so I'm not saying to like BS things, but if you don't know things, like it's, you should try and figure it out. And it's about showing people that you know the process to do it, not necessarily that you know it to a T, that you can predict it. And just like the little things, um, like. We're obviously not matching today, but when we presented, we, we made sure to, to match and have a similar theme, um, so to show that we were in sync, that we can work well together. So, yeah, a lot of the, those subtleties and the little cues that you can do, like the we all we had Austin and I had red power ties, and I believe the girls had matching red which was it skirts. Or no shoes. shoes. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. Had matching red shoes. Yeah. No earrings. Yeah. Well, for the semi finals. We had, I, someone got a response that they did not like my earrings, so apparently don't wear earrings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Or yeah, more than happy to... Specific? What yeah. was your business? Oh, sorry. So our business... <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're working on a redesigned walking assistive device. Are you familiar with gait trainers? So they're essentially like elderly walkers, except the person is harnessed into the device. So right now there's four points of contact. They're very wide and bulky. And we found a way, or conceptualized a way, to reduce that into a bicycle structure. Um, so that's significantly reduced and a lot more comfortable. 
It's for individuals with cerebral palsy. Um, I got the idea from my little brother who has cerebral palsy. And so I, would, I grew up seeing all these problems and how much the devices suck. And so obviously, as, as an engineer, I want to take it upon myself to make something better. Um, but doing our research, doing the summer launch pad, actually, we went through the Lean Methodology program and interviewed other people with mobility disorders, such as the elderly, and found that if we customized the harness, we could, we could include that in our target market as well. So that was a really big step, because the market size goes from a niche to almost everybody. Everybody eventually. Yeah, eventually, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so as Peter mentioned, you know, my new name is actually Kate Marayoshi. I recently got married um, before I was Polyakova. Um, so we'll wait. Oh, okay, perfect. Awesome. Um, thanks, Peter, for the introduction. I appreciate it. But I'm still going to tell you a little bit about myself. So I currently work as an associate at Salton Ventures, and I'm a director at uh, Accelerate Hawaii. So I graduated from uh, Shadler College. That was around like five years ago. And since then, you know, right after college, I actually joined Salton Ventures as an analyst. So uh, how many of you know about Salton Ventures? OK, awesome. So Salton Ventures is actually a small venture firm here in Hawaii that has been working with startups and entrepreneurs for the past 10 years. Uh, so what we do is run like multiple programs through we educate entrepreneurs, through we accelerate their businesses, as well as we invest through these programs. So as Peter mentioned, it's like one of the programs when I actually joined Salton Ventures that I've been part of is Accelerate UH. And Accelerate UH, you know, um, we ran it since 2014. You know, and we kind of concluded the program in, what is that, 2018. And uh, the Accelerate UH program served as a foundation for the new program that actually UH launched, which is UH Ventures Accelerator. Uh, so throughout those years, you know, we became like one of the best accelerators, one of the top 30 accelerators in the nation, won multiple, multiple federal, um, federal awards from Economic Development Administration and things like that. So it became a great program. So I would strongly encourage you after that to actually look into UH Ventures Accelerator if you are looking to for funding or any additional mentorship and things like that. Now after that, so currently I'm a director at Accelerate Hawaii. So Accelerate Hawaii is more focused on uh, you know, providing resources to all uh, entrepreneurs across Hawaii, not just those that are focused here at University of Hawaii. So therefore, we provide various workshops, connections to network, um, you know, and all those things that actually entrepreneurs need, right? We are still kind of developing the program. And the last thing that I do at Salton Ventures is actually run the, our internship and fellowship program. Through we, we actually had around over 100 interns and fellows that went through our program, through which you get an opportunity to actually see what we do at Salton Ventures. Uh, also get to connect to the entrepreneurial community that is here in Hawaii. So that's a little bit about me. So what I would like to do right now before we actually start, so how many of you have here actual business ideas or are still searching for business ideas? Okay, everybody. Okay, are there any teams or is it mainly individuals? Teams? All right, so what I would like to do before we actually move forward and talk about the agenda and what we're gonna do, uh, we're not going to do introductions right now, but actually that's going to come a little bit later. What I would like you to do, if you have a pen and paper, or write it on your computer, it's going to be one sentence introduction of your company. Like what your company is or what your idea is. So we'll take like two minutes. So, you know, today what we're going to talk about is actually uh, figure out how to build a lean business. After that, we're going to dive into like the initial steps that you actually need to take in order to kickstart your business, right? Um, which is first doing the market research, figuring out your value proposition and your customer segments, and then seeing like how you can actually get to product market fit. One thing, you know, getting to product market fit, I'm not necessarily expecting that after this workshop you're all going to figure out your product market fit because it's definitely a process, right? But at least I hope to give you some of those initial steps that you should take and start validating your business and seeing like, okay, is this actually worth pursuing, right? So. How many of you heard about lean methodology? Okay, how many of you use lean methodology in practice? Okay, so before we dive into uh, how to build a lean startup, so what is, uh, what is the definition of a startup? Anybody? 
you guys, if you don't raise your hand, I'm going to be picking people. So if there are any volunteers, go ahead. Go ahead. Can you a little bit speak up so everybody in the back can hear you? Pretty good, pretty good. Okay, somebody else? Oh, come on, guys. You're all starting a startup, so you got to have an idea of what is going on. Here we go. Mm, okay, so really unique. So one more, one more person. All right, did you Google that or you actually? Okay. Well, that was pretty close, though. That was pretty close. So I heard there's some words. So startup, uh, according to Steve Blank, right, is a, a startup is an enterprise in search of a scalable and repeatable business model, right? So you all are starting this journey that you are figuring out, actually, this business model. A lot of people, you know, some people think like, oh, you know, like startup is actually a small, small corporation, but that's not necessarily true, right? When you're starting your startup, there are a lot of uncertainties that you actually need to go through, and you gotta figure out, you know, and you are dealing with a lot of risk. So, when talking about risk, go ahead. No, so repeatable actually means that you can expand your business quickly. Right? So for example, I would say like if you have a barber shop, right? It means like it really depends how much money you're actually gonna make. It depends on the people that, you know, how many people and how many barbers do you have there, right? But when you, for example, compare it to a software, you can develop one software that can be applied into multiple geographies, you know, countries and things like that, right? So you, you are looking for that scalable business model where it's not like we're gonna have, you know, you have one input and you're gonna have one output, right? You are looking for a scalable model where you have one input and can generate multiple outputs at the same time. So that is the scalable part. And the repeatable part uh, means that you need to figure out what actually works, right? Because a lot of things, as we mentioned, there are a lot of uncertainties right now in your business that you don't necessarily know about. However, you gotta figure out certain model that being like, okay, if I do this, you know, this is gonna actually happen. If I put $10 million into marketing or whatever that is, or even $1,000, this is what's gonna be the outcome. Did I explain it a little bit better? So as I mentioned, 75% of startups fail, right? Because there is a lot of unknown unknowns that you don't even know about and that you gotta actually need to deal with uh, throughout your process. So when talking about you know, reasons to fail, can you maybe take like one minute and actually rank these from most common reasons that startups fail to least common reasons? So number, uh, number one is gonna be the most common reason why startups fail. So if you can just put the numbers and kind of run it through. Okay, so how many of you think that the most common reasons that startups fail is poor marketing? Let's raise hands. All right. What about bad location? Okay, one. Ran out of cash. Okay. Lost the competition. And no market need. All right. So, in fact, you know, no market need is the number one reason that actually startups fail, right? And there are many other ones that you actually got to be deal with it and you got to overcome these. However, you know, the no market need is surprisingly a really big reason why startups fail. And if you have no market need, that means you have no customer. That means you're not generating revenue and therefore you're not going to be, you're going to be just burning cash, right? However, there is a method that can help you to eliminate, you know, or figure out if there is a market need or not, and especially increase your chances of succeeding in your business, or we say like you get to de-risk your startup, right? And that methodology is actually a lean startup, and it will help you with all these um, when you're gonna be going through your business. So, you know, even the most, since not many of you actually heard about lean methodology, 
It's many of the successful startups actually use lean methodology in one way or another, as well as you know, some of the corporations that are out there in, the, in their processes. So what lean actually means? When, you know, before Steve Blang actually came up with this great idea of lean methodology, uh, you know, you started your business and it was, there was no method to the madness, right? Like there was no like step-by-step -step process where you can actually validate your business. So you need to rely on your, you know, trial and error. However, you know, with Lean, it actually provides you a tool that helps you to, to uh, apply the scientific method to startups. So it's basically like a step-by-step -step process for you to figure out if your business, you know, is if there is there and there, right? If it's actually worth starting up. So scientific method. So how many of you are familiar with scientific method? Okay, majority, right? So we specifically are talking about the hypothesis testing, right? So when you, in your you know, science classes, the basics are you have a hypothesis, so here's what we're thinking that's gonna happen. Then you're gonna run an experiment, right? After that, you're gonna look at the results, like what actually happened, and the action that you're gonna take after that is okay, so this is what we think we're gonna do next, and you form a next hypothesis, right? What you're gonna do in a lean methodology and with your business, right, a lot of these science experiments are happening actually in the lab. For your business, it's gonna be happening outside of the lab, right? So we have hypothesis, the same thing, so you're gonna form what you actually think is gonna happen for various, uh, various aspects of your business. Then you will go out and test it with your customer, Right? Going out there and talking to your customers is running these experiments. Because if you have no customers, you have no business. After that, you're gonna come back. You're gonna look at the results and seeing what the customers said or what they actually did, because sometimes those two are a little bit different. And then you're gonna form, you're gonna figure out what you're gonna do next and form your next hypothesis, right? So as you can see, like this process is not one step done process. This is an iterative process, right? So you're gonna be doing this over and over and over. So basically forming your hypothesis, thinking like, okay, what do I think my customers want? Or what do I think my customers are actually gonna do? After that, you're gonna build your experiments. Then you're gonna go back, you're gonna go talk to these people and figure out what you actually learn. And then you're gonna iterate your business. And you're gonna pivot or, or persevere, right? So one thing that a lot of people don't necessarily necessarily realize that a lot of startups, the idea that you have now is gonna be a completely different thing when you're gonna be, you know, to that, the idea that you're gonna become a millionaire with, right? So here, like a little bit of dose of reality, how it actually works with startups. So before we go into this, um, I wanted to ask, how many of you actually have a product already? Okay, cool, how many of you have customers? Okay, how many of you are making revenue? Whoa. I think it's kind of banner, you are, you are or you are not. Is there money in the bank or it's not, right? But you know, it, from what I've seen, a lot of you are somewhere, I would say, here, I guess, right? So everybody sitting here is really enthusiastic. This is gonna be a great idea. Oh my God, you know, this is gonna be an awesome journey that we're gonna go through. And that's what we've seen even with the startups that we actually work with, right? Uh, some of them, majority of them already have certain product or business already. Some of them already have revenues, right? So they were a little bit out here. However, through the programs, you know, specifically for me through Accelerate UH, where we've been going, you can see, you know, like this was the week one, day one, second week, third week. And by, you know, like the first month, people were usually here. So nobody was really happy, right? So what's gonna actually happen here, you're gonna be really excited, but then you gotta deal with like, okay, the product development is not on time. My teammate actually that said that it's gonna de uh, devote this time to my business said like, oh sorry, you know, like I have finals or any other exams and I can't necessarily do that, right? You're gonna figure out that you have certain bugs um, in your product, you're gonna figure out like, okay, you know, like customers are known as, I have this beautiful website or I have this beautiful product, but nobody's buying it, right? And why is that? So it's a tough journey when you're actually gonna be coming in here and it's gonna be pretty steep down. However, the most successful startups, what they actually do is experiment, pivot, and iterate, right? So therefore, as any individual, as business, you can learn from your mistakes from the things that you're doing, right? 
And this is the lean methodology should actually help you to get through this all the way when you get a product market fit. The product market fit is when you actually have a product that people want to buy and are excited about, right? And that takes a long time to actually get here. And once you get that, you know, you can hit, you know, uh, the, you know, kind of scale up your business. So as I mentioned, you know, majority of the startups, like two thirds of the startups, actually work from the original idea. What we see with the founders is like, at the beginning, it's so attached to the original idea, right? And like, oh my god, this is my baby, it's awesome, I don't really understand why people are not actually buying my product, right? Or people don't understand what I'm actually doing. A lot of times, what I gotta tell you, is like, you baby, it's going be ugly. Right? I mean, that's the reality. It's not what you think, it does not necessarily matter as much as what your customers are actually thinking, right? Because those are the people that are going to make your business succeed. All right. So, how many of you actually recognize some of these startups? Come on. Even this big one? Facebook. Yes. What did they do at the beginning? Is it a class project? Well, kind of. You made fun of people? Yes. Well, not, not necessarily fun of people, but nobody watched social network in a long time. Oh, great to attract like other female students. Exactly, <laughs> right? So Facebook, face smash, face smash, actually started on uh, on one of the campuses, and it was a tool that actually scraped all the websites for the pictures of the girls that are in, in college, and then you get a compete, you know, you will like have, have two pictures and compete or compare, which is actually more attractive, right? Which is a completely different thing what the Facebook is right now, right? If you look at it. All right, so we get one. Look at this one. I can almost guarantee that all of you are using it. <laughs> Andy and B. No. Instagram? Exactly. So Bourbon started, um, it was actually the original idea of Instagram, right? And the original idea of Instagram, anybody heard of Foursquare before? Okay. So Bourbon was actually a Foursquare, right? So it was a location based app where you get to check in into the places, right, when you are hanging out with people. But the one the feature about it was like you can actually post the pictures of the people and what are you doing, the meals and what things like that, right? However, that was not necessarily as successful. What happened then, the founders actually realized like what was the key of the business was that, well, people are posting a lot of pictures and people are liking those pictures, right? And that's kind of what transformed into an Instagram, which is like a picture-based app where you get the likes and things like that. All right, this one. Anybody? Okay, so we talked about Facebook, Instagram. No. I know it kind of looks for the pink, but even logos change, by the way. So don't get attached to your logo. Okay, okay what is another social network that you actually use? Twitter? Exactly. So Twitter uh, started as an audio, which was. Um, you can actually record like a short, like record it in a short podcast, right? Which was completely different when you see like Twitter now, like which are the short messages. Well, they expanded this year, not so short anymore, but basically that's what it was. So you can see like even the most successful founders and startups go through this transformation and figure out what actually works, right? Because if certain like features and things and how you structure your business don't necessarily work and are not making money or not getting any traction, you don't have a business. Copy, right? Alright, so your goal at the beginning, or all startups that they have, is finding this like loose product market fit, right? So it means that you develop a business model. It's not the, when we we're talking about product, it's not just your product per se, right? It's not the physical product, it's not the software, but it's actually your business model, right? That's your business model, national market. 
right? Are there people that want, that are willing to buy, that are willing to use um, your service or product that you're actually seeing? And that's when we see this product market fit. Any questions so far? Go ahead. Uh, the three companies you mentioned before are all tech companies, so they can, I don't know, by changing some program code, fairly easily change their logic. So if I have a real hardware product, I don't know, like a table, it's probably fairly difficult to switch to a chair or like some completely different product. So would you say this kind of, I don't know, is, it is something especially for the tech startups no. or is it for everything? I think it's for everything. You know, I would look at it like, okay, if you have a table, right, that you develop and it's an awesome table, right, but nobody's actually going to buy it. You know, you don't, as I mentioned, you don't necessarily have a business, right? So either you can have a table and you might find one customer that is willing to actually purchase it. However, you're not going to be selling hundreds of tables and actually having a business, right? You might think it is a hobby in creating these beautiful tables that I don't want to say it, but nobody wants, right? So therefore, if you are serious about like transitioning going into this business, right, you gotta figure out like, okay, you know, throughout the process, like this table, you know, why people don't like it, right? What do they actually need? You know, what, you know, like what, what is the problem with the current table that I actually have, and how can I adjust it in order to make it more attractive to the people that are looking for tables? Right? You might be selling coffee tables, but people are interested in, you know, office desks. Right? And a lot of times as a founder you've got to make those decisions. Because, you know, if you're you have your current idea, you have your beautiful baby, right? Are you willing to abandon it and go completely to something else and make this actual business? Right? One other thing I will add is that you should think about the pivot also is not necessarily about taking the, the core idea and throwing that whole idea away. That, that can happen, and that should happen if the market isn't giving you the right feedback. But it could also be pivoting around different aspects of the way that you think your business model is going to work. So face match, in, for example, you know, if you think it from a market segment standpoint, the market, they think of the market segment that they were targeting, like post-adolescent boys basically, right? And the market segment that they're actually making all their bread and butter profits off of today. They're totally different market segments. I mean that group doesn't even use Facebook. That you know that that age group. So that's actually also a pivot. So don't get too hung up on on the on the idea that you have to throw everything out and start again. You know, from I thought I like the table to chair analogy because it's so it's such a dramatic change but it, it could all just be that you know the table that you're selling doesn't it three legs. doesn't have to have three legs it needs four or vice versa so, so you know for a lot of you that are just starting your business like that is the purpose of the lean methodology is actually make sure that you know you're not you're learning throughout the process and you don't build the whole table before you actually go to the customer, right? And figure out that nobody wants it and spend this all the time and resources in order to do that. But it's to actually save you those time and resources by talking to your customer what they actually wanted, and observing their behavior and learning from that, right? That's the iterative process. And it's not, I know we're talking mainly about, it's about the product. However, you gotta be testing also with a lot of business aspects. What is the price, right? What is the marketing that you're actually going to have? What are the channels that you're going to be using in order to deliver your product, right? So those are, you're not going to be testing like, okay, does my product actually work, which is really important. However, you might have a great product, but if you don't know how to get it to the customer, or you're not charging the right price for them that works for them, or your target customer, it's still not going to work, right? Great question. <clears throat> I'm going to summarize the theme, right, when we talked about it, is to eliminate that uncertainty, right, like, do people actually want this? After that, you know, it helps people smarter, it makes harder, be capital efficient, right, so you're not wasting the money on developing a beautiful product that nobody wants, uh, and hoping that once you develop it, everybody's going to flock and actually buy it, you know, that happens like never. And then it helps you save development time, 
And overall, you know, it kind of helps you keep a little bit of sane while you're going through this process. Anybody, any other questions about me so far? Go ahead. So please capitalize in your slideshow. Is it an acronym or something? Yeah. Good question. Nobody asked me for that. Uh, at the beginning stage, beginning stage when we do not get the funding yet, so can we not likely to develop our program? 100%. 100%. And actually, for example, like you should be using Ling right from the start, right? So the funding, maybe this program is an exception, uh, or you know, like the Peace Lancet that we have. A lot of time, people aren't going to give you money if just on an idea, right? I think maybe your parents will believe in you, but they're not investing in your business, they're investing in you, right? And a lot of people, especially strangers, don't do that. And that Yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can pivot at any time in your startup. Uh, whether that's, you know, as I mentioned, the lean methodology and everything also happens with the big businesses, right? With the corporations. A lot of times they launch new products and things like that. So you gotta so you gotta change and evolve in terms of being successful because the marketplace is not gonna stay the same, right? Maybe for some of the faster evolving, you know, the markets, it's like what happened, you know, what you thought that actually works one month. You know, it's not going to work like three months or one year from now, right? So you still get to be learning and pivoting and kind of figuring out what works or doesn't, right? And that will allow you to actually stay ahead of the competition, right? If you know your market better than everybody else, you are able to do the decisions that are necessary in order to appeal to that market, right? Any other questions? Perfect. <clears throat> so there's one book that I actually really like. Uh, I'm pretty sure they have it here in Pace as well. It's called Running Lean, and it's a really, uh, I would say, a step by step guide for you to actually go through this lean process at the beginning and validate your idea, right? So, the author said Running Lean is a systematic process for iterating from plan A to a plan that works before running out of resources, right? But that's time. most of the time it's money, but it can be your time, or whatever you need. All right, so um, some of the, I'm going to introduce you to some of the tools that we used in the past that will actually help you to get through this process. And one of those tools is the Business Model Canvas. So the Business Model Canvas, what it is, it is a business plan on a page, right? So it's not necessarily, how many of you wrote a business plan before? Woo, a lot of you. How much time did you guys spend on writing a business plan? A lot, okay? And then once you wrote it, how many times you actually went back and changed it? Times, okay, in a span of a year, six months, right? So business plans, you know, I'm not gonna tell you like you should not be doing business plans. Business plans are great in order to look at your overall business uh, and like presenting your business, thinking through all the aspects. However, it does not necessarily, it's in the long run, right? it takes time to actually write, which problems you usually don't have. Um, and then what happens is like, you don't, you know, you get to put 30 pages in order to figure out, like, see all the aspects, right? So this business uh, model has what it actually helps you to do, it's have it all on one page and helps you adjust it quickly as you go and learn things. Um, is there a chance I sent a video to play the video? Yeah, I guess so. It's loaded. Okay. So you're just gonna data. Oh, yes. yes. If that's you. Did anybody use this model canvas before or similar a similar tool? Okay. How did you like it? It's I feel like it's useful for getting like the different parts of the business. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it's you know like not like no tool is perfect. Do the same for you. Let's dive in to see how it works. There are nine essential building blocks that make up any business model. When you get all nine blocks working together, you'll have answered the fundamental questions any business model 
solve. We'll start here with customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the types of relationships you're establishing with your customers and how you're acquiring and retaining them. Pricing mechanisms through which your business model captures value are documented under revenue streams. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. So you can describe the infrastructure you need to create, deliver, and capture value. The key activities show which things you need to do to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model. Since you won't own more key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. Once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. Any business model can be done this way. Nine building blocks working to reinforce and strengthen each other. But before you make a model for yourself, it helps to see what a breakthrough business model looks like in action. Like this one. Low-cost airlines revolutionized air travel thanks to their disruptive business model. Let's first look at their value proposition. A low-cost airline offers ultra-cheap flights to their main customer segment, budget travelers, by adopting a no-fault policy. And this leads to additional revenue streams because customers pay for their ticket and additional fees on items like food and drink, priority boarding, and luggage. The airlines save even more money through their choice of channels, selling only through call centers and the internet, making for efficient, if not always convenient, customer relationships that are automated and often impersonal. Okay, that covers the right side of the canvas, the part everyone can see. The left side of the canvas is what's going on backstage. Like their choice of key resources, they reduce maintenance and training costs by using a single aircraft model for the whole fleet. And they only fly to cheap airports where it's cost efficient to land or where they even get paid to touch down. Planes that do land have quick turnarounds, so they get back in the air earning money as quickly as possible. And they form key partnerships with others in the travel industry, like car rental, hotel, and insurance companies. Finally, other cost structures. For maintenance, training, airport, and call center costs are trimmed to their lowest levels. All of these pieces working together make airfares almost impossible for traditional airlines to compete. There's nothing superior about these airlines except their business models. They're reaching an entirely new segment of travelers out of reach for traditional airlines. Cutting out costs is pretty exciting, right? But wait, just because it's successful for discount airlines doesn't mean it will work for your idea. Luckily, the business model canvas allows you to iterate many models and test them quickly. Let's get started with your own business idea. All right, so this was like a quick introduction into the this, uh, business model canvas, right? And I'll, you'll have all those links and videos and Google resources that I'm going to share after, so you can actually watch it again. <clears throat> so, Yes. Perfect. So today what we're going to focus on are mainly customer segments and value proposition, right? Because I believe like without those two, all the other ones don't, don't necessarily matter. I believe you figured that out. So kind of to summarize, right? Since it's a business plan on the page, it helps you focus, right? So it has specific areas that you're actually going to be looking into. Um, and it allows you to be flexible, right? Like changing something on one page is a little bit different than changing, you know, rewriting your whole business model. And it provides transparency, right? If you're using it correctly and you're you are using it with your team, you can actually keep track of the changes and the learnings that you have throughout the process. Some of the mistakes that people do is you just fill it once, right? Like this is a live document. You should be, every time you learn something, you should adjust your business model canvas, right? So using it consistently in order to be useful. Uh, you don't think everything you wrote is a hypothesis, right? Some people write certain things and they, you know, treat it as that is the truth, right? Every single thing about your business can be tested and validated. 
Okay? And it should be tested and validated. Because whatever you think, as I mentioned, it doesn't necessarily matter. Whatever the customer thinks, it's what matters. And when you are writing these hypotheses, some of the people start with being very, very generic. Right? You say, like, okay, you know, like, for example, my customer segments. We'll say it will be, you know, males between 30 and 40. Right? How many businesses are actually targeting males between 30 and 40? Quite a few. Right? Or are you going to say, like, okay, you know, our customers uh, want to be healthy. You know, that's the benefit that we're going to be providing. Like, the question is, who doesn't want to be healthy? Right? So you're going to be a little bit more specific with the hypothesis that you're actually going to put in there. Because if you're not specific, everything is going to be correct, but it's going to be really bad and can be applied to any business that is out there, not just necessarily yours. Right? Your business model canvas should be specific to your business. You've got to figure out, as I mentioned in the video, what actually works for you specifically you, and what are you doing, and what are you trying to accomplish? Any questions so far? So this is kind of reiterating that like, you're going to be going, even with this model of Canvas, through this developer vision learning over and over and over and over. So it's always testing, always iterating, always validating. So there are certain, as I mentioned, not, you know, there are a lot of things that are not perfect. The business model of Canvas is not necessarily the exception to it, right? So from those, you know, the segments that you've seen that, what is, what is actually missing? I can go back to all the same. Timeline? Sorry? A timeline? Mm, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. That is also missing, but in terms of validating your business model, you know, there are two very big things that I believe, I hope everybody thought about. Is, I, I see customer segments, but one, the marketing strategy, how you're going to tackle your customer segments, what advertising that you would That goes more into customer relationships and oh. chats. Okay. More customer relationships, sorry. One more shot. Operational strategy? It's not there, but. I think that kind of goes to like using the key resources and activities. Relationship uh, with PC. That is important, but not necessarily, right? That kind of would go into the key resources and partners that you're going to have. Is it pivoting? Um, not necessarily. Okay, competition. Exactly, right? So a lot of you, you know, this is just looking at your own business, right? What you're going to think about, like, okay, and the, those are kind of the first things that you should think about is who is out there doing exactly the same thing as I am, right? As well as how big is actually the market that I'm going after, right? So the two things, main things uh, that we see that are missing in this are market size and competition, right? So how many of you can name at least three competitors? That they currently have. Let's see, how many? Hands up. All right. I hope before you actually present at the competition, all, all the hands are going to be up. Right? Um, how many of you look into how big is their market? You? You? Okay. Awesome. So I think if you haven't done it, so and it seems, unless you guys are really shy, it seems like not a lot of you have done that. Um, that's when you leave this room today, that's the first thing that you should do, right? How are you actually going to know if it's, this idea is worth pursuing? A lot of times, people come and say, like, oh, they're the only ones. I have this great idea. I woke up today. You know, nobody thought about this for sure, you know? But then, you know, you look online and there's another 50 people doing exactly the same thing that already have a functioning business, are targeting your market, have a big team, have a big piece of funding, and, you know, you got to consider, like, okay, 
I got to figure out, it does not necessarily mean that you cannot pursue your idea, right? However, you got to figure out how unique are you and what are you going to do different in order to make your business successful, right? You're not the only one out there. All right, we're going to dive into, I'll give some tips on the market research, right, and what you should actually do. So as an entrepreneur, we mentioned there are a lot of uncertainties that you're actually dealing with, right? And what you can do as a first step in order to eliminate those uncertainties at the, you know, at the beginning is actually start Googling and learning about your market and who else is doing what you are actually doing. And what are the market trends, right, and things like that. Because why would you not like to have necessarily like data and a lot of analysis and all the information about your market when you are going into the unknown, right? It's almost like you're going into it blind, basically. <laughs> so, why do market research? Estimate how big is the opportunity, right? And I would look at that from two perspectives. So, it's for you, right? So, for example, if you want to build, build a billion dollar business, right? But then there are just five people that can actually use your product, you know, I don't think anybody's going to pay a billion dollars for anything of their exception. Right, so it's for you, it depends really like, I believe maybe all of you don't want to build a billion dollar business, right? You want to make like one, two million dollars a year? Fine, right? But try to figure out like, okay, how realistic is, is that actually, right? How many people are there or how many, you know, like how many products or services do you actually need to sell in order to get to that one or two million, right? And the other part is, also, when you're looking at it from the venture capital perspective, when you're raising money, right? Uh, a lot of times, venture capitalists don't necessarily invest until it's a billion dollar opportunity, right? The math for the funds and for the VCs does not necessarily work out if you're a one to two million dollar business per year. There's, you know, if you if you have any questions about the math behind it, I'll be happy to talk about it. But that's for another day. The other one is communicate effectively, right? If you do your market research. You probably will know who is actually your target market, how many people are there, where are they, how they look for their information, how are you going to get to them. There's a whole slew of information that you can actually gather from this, right? So it will help you with other aspects of your business as well, right? It's not just figure out who's your target market, but it will help you with marketing, figure out the structure of your channels, figure out your supply chain, and things like that. It helps you identify and understand opportunities. Right? So as you would figure out that there are other people doing that, you might say like, okay, they're doing that, but there's a specific niche that they don't serve, right? Or a specific market, or things like that. Like a lot of people think, you know, like for example, for like huge companies, okay, you know, there's one in California or the mainland, but then you see like, well, nobody's doing it here in Hawaii. So this is an uncapped market that might not necessarily make sense for them to come here and set up operations. Right? And you can take advantage of that opportunity and, you know, kind of exploit it. It will help you with potential obstacles or problems. So, <clears throat> one thing that we always ask when somebody said that this has never been done before, is like, why it hasn't been done before? Right? So that kind of like, if you have a lot of businesses that try, let's say, a specific, you know, solve a specific problem that you're going to solve it, you got to think about, what why nobody done that before, right? Or why those businesses were not successful? A lot of what I do is actually learn from other people's mistakes wherever you can, right? So you don't go through that. And the last one, benchmark evaluate your success, right? So when you look at an overall market, you can actually compare yourself to other people and see how successful you are. Are there any questions about this one?
talk about that will answer your questions that you're actually asking, right? But a lot of times you can learn, you know, when you're at the beginning stages, what you are learning more, it's not about if you like your product, but what are the problems that a company have? What are the needs that they have so you can develop product that they actually want, right? And that's what you should start with. Go ahead. How do you do the research on like failed approaches with com from companies with uh, similar idea? Because I look for like specifically my specifically my idea, I probably won't find any companies because if I would find it, they would be probably successful, right? So is there like a I don't know a graveyard of like startups where I can just go through and see <coughs> the similarity? Yeah. So. A lot of times, well, it depends like what stage your business is at, right? However, a lot of times you will actually find the companies that raise millions of dollars and were not successful, right? So one way, what what you can do is actually, you know, use Google and look into like search and news articles and things like that. The other one, if you kind of see the businesses or find a competition and you figure out they actually went out of the business, what you can do is call up the founder, you know. Ask them for coffee, email them, you know, and things like that. Because if they are successful, they probably iterated and they have another business, right? But you can still actually learn, you know, from the mistakes of others and actually ask them, them, right? You have the whole network here in case, you know, at the university that know founders that have started multiple businesses. So use it, right? You can go and ask Peter, Peter, how many people do you know that their business actually failed? They've tried a business and they failed. Since you were in a case. Oh, since I was in a case, I was going to say like. Yeah, I know. I, I, kind of, I started really broad, but then I was like, well, maybe you should put a compliment on that. I mean, everybody feels a little bit, so I, I don't know. I'm good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's like there are like a lot of founders actually start businesses and they have a lot of experience and see what work that they did, right? And I'm pretty sure you know through the office hours and things like that, they'll be more than happy to actually talk. Or, you know, if they didn't fail and they're doing something similar, you can ask what are the obstacles that they ran into as well. Any other questions? So that's a good start, right? However, you know, as we're going to talk about, uh, there are, you know, primary and secondary research, which both are necessary. However, what we see, you know, like even from the companies that are seen pitch, a lot of times why I stress so much the secondary research and looking out of Google, because it's easy, right? Only thing that costs you is your time. Even the most expensive reports, I believe you can access them through the library, right? So therefore, it does not necessarily cost you money, but a lot of people don't do that, right? How can I believe that you're going to succeed with your business if you don't even know that there are, you know, 10 competitors that are doing exactly the same thing. How are you going to be actually unique? How are you going to make money? Right? If you don't know how many customers are out there, you know, you cannot necessarily estimate how much money you're going to make. You can think that you can make a billion dollars. As I mentioned, if you have five people that are going to be using your product, it's highly, highly, highly unlikely that that's going to happen. Right? And uh, as I mentioned, like, having a billion dollar business, not everybody wants that. Right? So it really comes down to your expectations and what you actually want to build and being a little bit realistic about it. Right? And having that reality check of doing the market research, doing, you know, uh, looking at the numbers that are out there, making a little bit of math and seeing like, is this realistic? Right? It's like more like a gut check. Any other questions? Go ahead. So how likely is it if I go to a company but has a similar business model than like I do, and uh, they just like tell me their secrets. I mean, is that a, do they experience with that? Is it like smart to go there and say like, oh, hey, I'm a young, like I want to start a startup, and can you be someone who like trouble you had in the beginning, so I can like have a better, so I can have a head start, or um, how would you approach these companies with similar business models? So, are you a student? Yeah. Okay. You know, I don't very few people when they come in and say, like, hey, I'm a student at the University of Hawaii and I would love to learn about your business and what are you doing, right? 
it, it's very unlikely that people are actually going to say no, right? I'm not saying, you know, you got to be kind of smart about it. You should not come in and say, like, hey, I'm planning to do exactly the same thing as you are. Can you tell me what you actually learned over the past five years that you've done so I can actually, you know, have a better condition? However, you can have this kind of conversations with people. It really depends on the person, on the business, and the things that you are doing. However, if you're not going to ask, you're never going to know. Right? The one thing about that is also, like, it depends how proprietary is your business, right? So a lot of people, uh, you know, have great ideas, and if you don't have, like, even if you have a protection, for example, if you're doing a technology, right, uh, it does not necessarily predict you 100%, right? However, if you don't talk about your ideas with other people, right, and get feedback for it, you know, it's basically you're developing your business in a vacuum, which is not going to work because businesses don't operate in a vacuum. All right. So, uh, here are a few definitions. The so market is a collection of customers that have a similar set of problems and needs. Or market research is understanding if potential customers will buy your stuff and if there are enough of these customers, right? So when you're doing your market research, you basically got to figure out these two things. So we have two types of research, right? One, you're going to be doing, you're probably going to start it, which is like the easier part, right? It's actually going to Google and start searching, right? It's looking at, you know, statistics, reports, studies, and other data what is actually out there. The second one is going to come directly from the customer. Right? It's that validation that you get from having those conversations with people that might be interested in your business. So, <laughs> most of the time, you know, you should be doing both. However, you know, we usually start with secondary. That should be your first step. Alright. So, what are we looking for? Um, Doing market research sometimes can be a pain, right? Because you're never actually going to find like specific number for you know this market that it is, and you got to kind of like find like multiple data points and combine them and see you know like doing that gut check. However, it's definitely worth it because when you're presenting to an investor or to anybody else about your business, they see that you did your homework and you know what you're talking about, right? What you want to do is become an expert in your business and the market that you are going into in order to build that credibility. And you know, build a successful business. So it's reports, summaries, aggregates, you know, Google search, and then as you mentioned, there's no such thing as original idea. Like I can guarantee you 100 percent that somebody somewhere in the world actually thought about exactly the same thing, same thing that you thought about, right? <clears throat> so uh, when we're talking the definition of research, right? So you look at market size. So how many people are there that need my product or service, right? Um, and then the second one you have, you're thinking about competition. Who else is competing for the same potential market? And then you have a top down and bottom up. So one, you know, like top down is basically looking how many, you know, you're looking at big numbers from the reports that you find. Okay, this market is ten million dollars, and you know, like these are the segments and like things like that. And then you kind of start cutting it down into being a little bit more specific, right? So you can, like, for example, for this lot, you know, how big is the automotive market, right? But then you're gonna kind of narrow it down. Okay, they're just doing EVs. Okay, they're just doing EVs, but they're luxury cars, right? So you can kind of cut it down, right? That's the top down. Bottom up is actually looking at your customer, right? Like seeing, like, okay, how many people are there that can actually afford or would like to have this business? Right? For one reason or another, then you're going to figure it out. And you're going to start building it out and being like, okay, you know, in Hawaii, I can estimate that I can sell this many cars, right, through the dealerships. And like, how many people are there? How many people are eating conscious? Or, you know, like, you like to do EVs or like stuff like that. So it's useful to do both, right? That's the one, like, talking to a customer and looking for how many people are there. And the second one is kind of like, we can up top, figure out, okay, $10 billion market, what I can actually realistically capture, right? And what you do is compare those two numbers. Like, are they similar? And usually they should be somewhere in the 
close, right? Any questions about that? All right, maybe we can do a short exercise. Everybody has their laptop, or I think everybody has a phone with them, right? Yeah. So, can we do a five minute search and figure out what is your market size, the top down? What do you find? Like how many people actually, you know, like what is the market that you're actually operating in? Just stay five minutes, do a quick Google search. Go ahead. 71.4 million Americans, not worldwide. Okay, so can you maybe tell us a little bit? Quickly, what your business does and what is the actual market? What are the So, the sentence you asked me to write down earlier, yeah. I had actually written down a few minutes prior, and I was happy <laughs> to have already done that because it clarified for me. So, Repost is a different approach to mental health care. I provide a structured program for the diagnosee and their families to keep everyone safe. <laughs> And my market, based on statistics found at uh, DBSA, Bipolar Disorder Statistics, um, 5.7 million uh, Americans suffer from bipolar disorder. My program actively involves 12 people around them as their circle of support. So those affected times, or those affected plus 12 times that number. Okay, it's a good start. It's a good start. Um, so, 12. So, who, how many people are actually going to be paying for your business? That depends on what product that I offer they're going to buy. Um, <clears throat> are you familiar with Dave Ramsey? Uh, no. Is anyone familiar with Dave Ramsey? The yes. financial advisor. Okay. okay. So his business model is what mine would be similar to uh, in that depending on where they are in the product funnel, uh, they would need different things. The program that I have is immaterial, but forms and teaching and uh, sponsorships on the podcast yeah. would all go to revenue. Okay, I see. So you have actually different aspects or different branches of your business. Correct. Right. Sounds good. So I think like you will, you know, I believe that's a, as I mentioned, that's a great start, right? But kind of diving a little bit deeper into that. One thing while you're figuring out your market is also figuring out how much money you can actually make from this, right? And then figuring out like, okay, from those, so you have 12 people that are affected and one person that is actually has disorder, right? Figuring out like who's actually paying for that. Right? It's it's all 13 people are paying for that. Right? And for different product lines that you're going to have, you will need to kind of figure it out, like, okay, what is the target customer and how many of those are there, and doing those basic numbers in order to figure that out. But that, as I mentioned, that's a great start. Anybody else want to share? Oh. Go ahead. So for mines, I have multiple, like, I guess, segments. But my main segment is 18 to 14, I know, 18 to 24-year-old females. and. In the state of Hawaii, and that's around 100,000. Okay. But that's just my main target audience. Okay. And now, let's get into that. What do you do, and why you chose, you know, kind of narrow it down to this group? Uh, so my business idea is a uh, digital visualization experience, similar to Team Lab in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, a digital experience like that has not been introduced into the United States. And the reason why Team Lab is so successful is because a lot of 18 to 24 year old females, they go, they go in there and take me the pictures there and that's like free marketing and everyone goes there. So if, we, if I can make something like that here in Hawaii, uh, it will be great uh, and with free marketing and that stuff. So okay, I see. Idea. So you have a previous example that they're doing something similar and then you're exploiting an opportunity to do it here in Hawaii. But that that'll be my main target segment. I mean, there's others like other track like families and kids and but for I think my main money maker would be the 18 to 24 year old female. Yeah. Well, those are all great starts, right? So you can see when you're thinking about you know narrowing down your market, you start being a little bit more specific. And the more specific you can get, right, the better. 
However, when you go to presenting, you can present this huge opportunity. What is the vision for the company and how many people are actually going to be using it? But then you got to know, like, okay, realistically, when I start, how much money can I actually make? So, after you're going to be doing your, you know, running the numbers, what you really want to do is actually talk about the competition, right? Um, again, it's the same as with, you know, doing the market research. You don't necessarily know who you are competing with or what other people are doing. You kind of be, you're going to be operating in a vacuum. So, worst thing that you can say when you're pitching to an investor or at a competition or anywhere else is saying, Nobody's doing what you do, right? In one sense or another, somebody's doing what you're actually doing, but you probably just don't know about it, right? So, uh, when we, you know, like, this is kind of the same thing, we have no competition. Like, for me, as an investor, or when people are actually, oh, let's do a little scenario, right? So, imagine that you are the investors, right? And we're going to reach you. And I'm going to pitch my business. Right? So our business is actually a HIPAA compliant telehealth solution. Right? So what I want you to do now is go online and search HIPAA compliant HIPPA telehealth solution. And I'll tell you where the only ones to be. So you are looking, you are looking, so what, you're talking about competition, right? What you want to look into, like, okay, are, am I actually the only person that is doing that, right? So are there, you can find any companies that are doing exactly the same thing. So it's a telehealth, so HIPAA compliant telehealth solution, right? So whoever finds a company or a name, just raise your hand. Three. So search for HIPAA compliant telehealth solution. Telehealth. H I P P A telehealth solution. And seeing if there are other companies providing HIPAA compliant telehealth solution. Okay, another one. All right. Anybody else? Anybody have more than one? Okay, all of you, perfect. Okay, so how long did it take you? Two seconds, okay. So now as an investor, what does it, what are your thoughts? Like I came to you, I'm asking you for money, right? It was like, hey, you know, give me $300,000, we have this awesome idea, and nobody's doing what we are doing, right? And you jumped on your computer and found in two seconds, that actually there are another, I don't know, I think there's way more than two people that are actually doing the same thing, right? So what are your first thoughts? Did the research? Did it do their research? Mm -hmm. Not really. Like to, you know, go the extra mile. If they're not going to do the extra mile just for the research to get to the point. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do once they get the funding? Exactly. Okay, something else? What makes you different? Yeah, a new question. Not trustworthy. Exactly, right? So here's this person that is asking for $300,000. I'm going to invest in it. And they were not even able to do two second research to figure out there are other people actually doing this. Right? It's a lot about the credibility and knowing what is out there. You've got to be the expert in your industry. You're not going to know everything. However, if I'm going to do a two minute research and know more than you, you're in trouble, right? So a lot of times it means all those things, like lazy, shaky, lack of confidence, you know, that's what be. And or, you know, if nobody's doing what you're actually doing, maybe nobody cares about what you're actually doing, right? So when we're looking at a competition, uh, a lot of times you have direct competition, right? So people that are doing essentially the same thing. And then you also have the indirect competition, right? Which is uh, products or services are not the same, but that satisfy the same same consumer need, right? So a lot of times, you know, for example, uh, when you have a transportation, right, or when you have, uh, you know, let's say Tesla. I used this example before, right? Well, you can say direct competition might be other EV vehicles that are actually out there, right? 
right? However, you know, in terms of why do we use cars to get them to point A to point B, right? What are the other means that you can actually use in order to get them to point A to point B? Public transportation, bikes, walk. Right? There are all these other things that are out there, right? And you've got to figure out that status, also what is the status quo, what are people actually doing right now, and why they should switch to your solution, right? <clears throat> so, you know, kind of to sum it up, in order to do your research, it you make sure that you don't waste your time, right? If somebody's doing exactly the same thing, you know, you probably, if you decide to, like, okay, this is the only thing that I want to do, you know, maybe it's not worth it, right? It helps you differentiate. By knowing what other people are doing, you can figure out how different you can be, right? What is the additional value that you provide uh, to the customer, right? And that can help you not just raise money and have a successful business, but even when you're pitching to, let's say, the investors, right? Why is it you? Why is it your business? What is unique about it? And it shows that you are in an expert status for investors as well as for the customers, that you know what you're talking about. There are lots of things that you say is what you have to do with nitrogen, but superior product quality, customer service, location, you know, and all these things that you can be done, right? So it's not necessarily just the features, it's again about the whole business model. How are you treating your customer? You can have a little bit of a different angle, right? For example, you're not charging subscription, or you're not charging like uh, you know, just for product or for service, but you're charging subscription, which is a little bit more affordable for people in the long run, right? That's a different business model. That's almost a different business, right? The more, like, the big thing is that if somebody's doing what you are doing, usually you get at least 10 times better than the competition you win, right? People like habits, right? They are, they like their walk paths. They're not like people that, if something works for them, why are you going to switch it, right? Why would you go, let's say, from Apple to Android if Apple completely works for you, right? The Androids have something 100% special specifically to me in order for me to, you know, make that switch and learn the new habits and, you know, like figure out how to operate the system and things like that, right? So think about it. It's, you got to be 10 times better than the competition you get. So uh, you also can figure out when you're looking at your competition, you're going to be looking also at your market trends, right? What is actually happening in the market that you can, what are the opportunities that you can actually exploit, right? Are there any shifts that are happening, right? People, you know, like for example, when you think about like Airbnb, right? When you look at 30, what is that, 30, 40 years ago, people were not comfortable, you know, they're telling you, you don't let anybody, you know, strange sit in your car or into your house. Now we're doing exactly the same thing. Right? So the trends change, so doing this research will help you stay ahead of the competition. Um, and also, the other part of the research is barriers to entry. Right? That comes to the question like, okay, why nobody is doing this? Right? You got to figure out where it might be technological. Right? So it's currently with this technology, it's actually not possible to do that. Right? Uh, it can be the market. You might have like people that are dominating the market, or the market is actually too small. Right? Or regulatory, right? Be seeing like there are certain regulations that your startup will not be able to overcome. Yeah, and basically through the iteration and having these conversations, that's when the iteration actually happens. Never exactly. So if you never actually talk to people, you're never gonna know. Right? And people, what you think, as I mentioned, it does not necessarily matter. It matters what the customer is saying. You might think, like, this thing, you know, it's going to solve all their problems. But if they don't think that, then nobody's going to buy it. They're not going to care. Right? You got to make people care. Right? And make sure, and they will care only if they have certain problems uh, that you can solve for them. Right? Or if you can provide them value. That's why it's called value proposition. All right, um, a lot of times when it comes to, you know, uh, talking about value proposition, it's what you, wanna, what you want it to be is the painkiller versus, uh, and not the vitamin, right? So it's basically these are the must-haves rather than nice-to-haves, right? So for example, um, how many of you take vitamins? All right, quite a few. Good for you. I, I also tried, but it didn't work out. Um, so, but it's for me, it's like, I know it's good for me, 
You know, I know it's going to help me probably in the long run, but do I need to have it? Right? Is it essential for my being? Right? Not necessarily. But I got to tell you, like, if I have like a migraine, I'm going to take that damn Advil because I don't want to have a migraine. Right? So you see that difference bet between when people actually must have this versus, oh yeah, this is, this is pretty cool. You know? And a lot of people are going to be like that. People try to be nice to you and say, oh yeah, that's a great idea. I love it. You know, um, that would be awesome. However, the tough conversation comes to that when you ask them. Like, oh, so you know, I have this product. I willing, so can, I, can you buy this? Or would you like to buy this? If there is some certain money or certain action required after that, people tend to be like, ah, is this really worth it? You know, like, and things like that. So you got to think about for your specific uh, customer segment that you're actually targeting, ask yourself, is this a painkiller versus vitamins? And when you are asking also about the problems that they have, you got to also think about like, okay, is this really huge problem or is this something that they actually encounter once a month and, you know, they kind of go through it and they don't necessarily care. But if, if I encounter it every single day and it's really bothering me, then I'm probably going to buy your product if it's going to save me time and money or like whatever that is. <clears throat> so here are some examples for fa uh, Facebook, right? So there you have, you're going to have different value proposition for each customer segment. So for example, for your education platform, you will have a different value proposition for the parents versus different value proposition for the kids, right? So the same with the, with the program, right? It was like if you have one patient and then all the other people, people will have different reasons why they're actually going to use your product, right? It's a very, it does not necessarily happen that everybody is using your product is using it for the same reason, right? I can use Instagram because I want to, you know, be in touch with my friends, and some people are there to actually make money, right? So you got to know who are those people and what are they actually doing, in, uh, and why are they there. Any questions about the value proposition? As I mentioned, you know, you are not expected to come up with your value proposition after this class, right? This is going to be a process that is going to be evolving as you go. And, you know, like the value proposition that you are doing today, it's going to be way different when you're going to be actually presenting it in, uh, you know, at a business plan competition. All right. These guys, customer segments, very, very important because no customers means no business. Um, so what are you actually looking when you are trying to define your customer segment, right? As I mentioned, as a business, you might have multiple customers. So first one, you are looking at demographics, right? So we were talking about the age, you know, like the race, and then like all these other things, right? But then what is even more important than demographics are these other things, right? What does a day in their life actually look like? You got to know, know where are they going, where are they getting the news? in order to figure out a different strategy. How does their day look like? What jobs do they want to get done, right? What pains do they want to solve? What gains do they want to see? How important are those, right, that goes into being a painkiller versus vitamin? And how do they solve the problem today, right? That's the competition, the status quo. What are they actually doing now? <clears throat> All right. So, you know, when you're looking at your customer segments at the beginning, you don't necessarily want to have these guys, you know, that it's like you have a Christmas and you got the, you know, Christmas sweater from your grandma. You know, how excited are you going to be about that? Unless it's an awesome sweater, probably not so much that you're never going to wear it because, you know, there are not enough ugly sweater parties for that. However, what you want your, the people and the customer segments is like this guy. He'll come and say, oh my God, this is awesome. You know, I'm going to wear it every day because I love Christmas all year around, right? So these are the people that you are looking into. A lot of people forget that you don't, at the beginning, you don't need to appeal to everybody, right? It's impossible to do that. Your objective is to define an early adopter, those early people that have the biggest pains, biggest needs, and are going to be fan for your products. At the beginning, they might not be a lot of them. However, you at least get to learn from their experience, right? And if you cannot find an early adopter, well, then probably nobody actually cares about what you are doing, right? So you are not looking for mainstream users, 
But at the beginning, what you're trying to figure out, are those early adopters? These are pretty broad. So the last, are there any questions about customer segments? Go ahead. So for now, I would say like what you are looking at now, right? And I would even say, you know, uh, as I better be specific and wrong rather than vague and right, right? Because otherwise you don't learn. So when you are talking about people that are drinking coffee, right? You can narrow it down like, okay, there are people that, you know, uh, that love the general Starbucks, right? There are people that go and get the fancy coffee. Right, like, okay, there are the people that are actually, you know, are those people that are actually going coffee, what do they do, right? Are those workers in downtown that just wanna get a coffee for a pick me up after work? Or is that somebody that actually wanna sit down and enjoy their coffee and meet with friends, right? So you kinda gotta dig a little bit deeper into, because, you know, people that want coffee, how many people like coffee? Raise your hands, right? All of them might be your you know, your mainstream user eventually. However, in order to differentiate yourself, right, from Starbucks or whoever, whoever else is selling the coffee, you gotta find what is kind of the unique part, right? Like what is unique about your coffee, right? Who is actually gonna be, you know, in love with your coffee and why? Does that make sense? Yeah. You can ask more questions, but. Okay, sounds good. Any other questions? Sorry. Okay, uh, how would you differentiate um, an early adopter to um, just like, to like a specific, only a specific amount of people where you're only like going to, so like, um, there'd be a small amount of people where um, there only those specific people would buy it. <coughs> an early adopter would be someone, you know, start when you're starting small and then pitching to a particular. So that is actually kind of the one and the same thing, right? The people that are excited, really excited about the, the product or service that you are providing are your early adopters, right? You're serving a really specific need or a specific niche at the beginning, right? And how are you gonna figure it out? It's from, you know, when we're talking about the hypo hypothesis testing, which you're gonna be going out there and actually asking people, right? You're gonna come and I'm gonna ask you, like, okay, uh, what type of coffee do you drink? Right? How often do you drink it? Why do you drink it? What is your favorite brand? Right? What do you like about this coffee? What do you don't like about this coffee? Right? Is it, for some people, it might be the taste. For some people, it might be, you know, I get to walk to Starbucks and it's so far, you know, or I, there's never enough space because there are so many people always and I have no place to sit down, right? That's what you're gonna figure out from those customer interviews that you're gonna have. And that will help you narrow it down, right? Think about it. Now what you have is just a hypothesis. You think that this is your customer. You think this is the value that you're providing. And what you're gonna go out there, talk to people, right? Run some tests and see what you are thinking actually matches what people want, right? All right, so why are we doing all this and figuring out who are you know, the customer segments and value proposition. As I mentioned at the beginning, what you wanna get into before you start scaling your business, you gotta get into this product market fit, right? And that means when your minimum viable product matches your customer archetypes needs, wants, and desires, right? And <clears throat> when it comes to, and as I mentioned, the minimum viable, when we are talking about product, we're not necessarily just talking about the specific platform or the physical product. The product is your overall business model, right? It's how, how do you charge? How do you deliver? So when you're going through the stages, and I feel like majority of you are actually at this stage, you're looking for problem solution fit. You gotta validate, you know, do I have a problem worth solving, right? Is there a problem that customers currently have that they are dying to solve and can I actually do that, right? After that, you're gonna move to product market fit, right? So have I built something that people want? First you figure out, okay, 
is there a problem? You don't need to build anything at this stage, right? You are just learning about the problems of the people, of your customer segments, and who they actually are. Once you figure that out, you can move from problem solution fit to product market fit. But if you don't know what are the problems, there is no point of actually coming up with all the marketing strategy, developing a product, because it's a waste of time. You will spend all this time developing this business, doing the marketing, putting up a website, and things like that, just to figure it out that nobody really cares or nobody really wants it, right? So it's about that saving time and resources. Product market fit, have I built something people want? So this is the stage where people actually start paying for, for your, uh, for your product or start using it and asking about it, right? And once you hit that and you figure out that scalable and repeatable business model, right? That's when you actually can, you know, put your uh, foot on a, ga on, a, on a paddle and start scaling. scaling. How do I accelerate the growth? How can I repeat it constantly or get it to more people, right? So, <clears throat> Problem solution fit, can it find the demographics of an early adopter? If you don't know who has this problem, then probably you know, it will be really hard to actually move to this one. Have a must have problem, right? we talked about it. Can define minimum features needed to solve this problem. Right? So you will be talking about the features, but you don't necessarily need to develop the product. Right? Have a price the customer is willing to pay. Figure out like, okay, is this a reasonable price, right? You might have a product and now you want a hypothesis is like people are gonna buy it for thousand dollars. And you go out there, it's a hypothesis, and people will tell you, you know what? Actually, you know, if it's it's a great product, I love it, you know, it will solve all my problems, but I don't have thousand dollars. If they don't have thousand dollars, right, they're not gonna ever buy it. Can uh, can you build a business around it, right? So that's the back of a napkin calculations and figure out, can this be profitable and sustainable, right? Because if it's not profitable, and if it's not sustainable, it's probably just a hobby, right? Then when we're going to, so once you check all these boxes, you kind of went through problem solution fit, right? And then we're gonna go to product market fit. So this, uh, how you can figure it out is actually, as your customer, if, uh, how unhappy would they be if you discontinue uh, this product, right? And you have like, like very, very unhappy, some, some, somewhat unhappy, you know, they will say, ah, oh, I'll be okay with that, I can live without that, and I don't really care, right? If you have at least 40% of the people that will say they will, you know, it will be end of their world if you discontinue this product, then you have a product market fit. Right? It needs to be people that are actually using your product, that they actually use it more than once, right? and they are completely in love with your product, that they cannot imagine their life without it anymore. All right. This is kind of the example. Let's see. So there is another tool that you can actually use for you know, another canvas, so we have the business model canvas, and this one is the value proposition canvas. Um, I will actually send you the link for the strategizer to actually figuring out, so this is your value, you know, figuring out your value proposition. This is your customer, right? So you are figuring out what are the pains that they have, what are the jobs that they wanna get done, as well as what are the gains that they wanna have after you solve that problem, right? And you are kinda matching it with your business, right? So what are the gain creators that you have, right? What are the pain relievers that your business is actually providing to them? And what are the products and services that you, through which you're gonna be providing these, right? And then you kinda get a, you get a this is the product uh, when you're gonna have the product market fit. Sorry, the problem solution fit. So, you know, we kind of talk about how you figure out your customer, how you actually kind of be delivering the value. And it's, again, it's more one thing that I want you to take away from this. It's about customer feedback, right? It's the customer feedback doesn't stop, right? Even when you have a running business and successful business, you still got to talk and get a feedback from your customer in order to stay on the top of the trends, right? Because if you don't talk to your customers, you might become obsolete, right? So, any questions so far about product market fit and problem solution fit? 
No? Okay. So we have, I still have time. Okay. What I wanted to go through is to give you kind of some advice how to get started on this customer interviews, right? Because I believe in order to succeed even at the business plan competition, you will need to go out there and talk to strangers about what are you doing and learning from them, right? And the customer interviews, it's how you're actually gonna, gonna do it, right? So here are some tips. Uh, build a frame around learning, not pitching. A lot of people when they come, right, they, say, they start pitching like, oh hey, this is my product and this is what, I, what I'm doing, what do you think about it, right? That's not what you are doing in these customer interviews. You don't, at the beginning, you don't even need to mention what are you doing. What you are learning about is the problem that they have, right? You wanna learn about them, not just learn about like what is, you know, initially, not what they think about your product, right? Because you're gonna make them biased. Don't ask customers what they want, measure what they do, right? So you're gonna be, when a lot of times it's better to have in-person interviews, because if you can see the reactions when people get excited and how much they actually talk about it, right? If you have a form, you cannot necessarily get that feeling from that, right? You don't know, okay, how excited or how frustrated they got about the, you know, the problem that you are actually solving. And then, you know, everybody wants to be a millionaire, have more money, right? Everybody wants to be healthy, but are they actually willing to take that step or are they doing something for it, right? Different thing is when I say I won versus what I'm actually doing, right? So you gotta figure out the people and kind of match those behaviors by asking those questions. Stick to a script to guide your interview, right? So you are having this you know, warm conversation. However, you also, before, you wanna prepare with a set of questions or hypotheses that you are actually testing, right? Because if you're gonna be asking different questions, all the time what you're gonna get is different answers to those questions because everybody understands it differently, right? So you wanna have this uniform uh, guide for your interviews. Cast a wider net initially, right? Um, a lot of founders, when they come in, and it's great, right? So what we ask them to do is, they, you have already in mind your specific customer, right? However, what you wanna do is initially interview Anybody, you start with the first 10, 15 interviews and it, you kind of start to narrowing it down pretty much to those people that it's, they find it really important, right? But cast a wider net. Don't just start with the people that you think are actually people that are gonna be using your product, right? Because you never know, it might not be the students, but it might be the parents, right? Prefer face-to-face -face interviews, we kind of talked about that. Uh, to make it easier, you know, I don't think everybody loves talking to strangers. Um, I don't, so it's kind of hard to start with the interviews and actually get it going. So start with the people you actually know, right? People who are in your network. However, that's just the start, remember that. You cannot be going forever to your group of friends and asking them how they like your product because if they're nice, they're gonna tell you, yeah, I love it, it's awesome, right? But, okay, if, all your friends, if you have so many friends that if all of them buy that, you have a million dollar business, go ahead for that. But I really doubt that, right? So what you wanna do is expand that beyond your friends. Go talk to strangers, go, people, go talk to people in the industry. And you have a great resource here in PACE of actually utilizing that network that university provides you, right? There's a network of alumni, researchers, business people, use it. Take someone along with you. Um, a lot of times, if you have two people, right, you can actually, if, this is just a recommendation, it's not a must have. Somebody can be taking notes from the interview. Sometimes, you know, people are not so comfortable when you are recording them, but you still gotta have notes, right? So you can kind of tag them with some of your partners here. Pick a neutral location, you know, like a coffee shop or something like that where they don't feel uncomfortable. Ask for sufficient time, right? So I would say initial interviews would go somewhere around to get enough data, would be around 30 minutes. Uh, don't pay prospects or provide other incentives, right? A lot of times if you provide incentives, people are more, you know, more likely to give you positive feedback and tell you what you want to hear rather than what, you know, what they actually think. 
avoid recording the interviewees. A lot of times, as I mentioned that at the beginning, I personally, when I interviewed people, I kind of ask to record. If they say no, that's okay. However, you know, as I mentioned, not a lot of people are comfortable with that, and you don't want to put those additional barriers there of being like, okay, you know, like I don't want to meet with you. Like initially, you're just having conversations. Document results immediately after the interview. Okay. So this was a big thing also when we were at uh, Pay Summer Launchpad, uh, when I was mentoring some of the teams, was that they went out, interviewed people, right? And I, then I, after that, I asked them, so how many people actually said this? I was like, oh, like majority. I'm like, majority is five? Ten, you know, like how many people actually said that, right? So you want to have this is that scientific method. You got to be writing it down and have some data that you can actually go back to and look into that, right? Doing the lean methodology is more about, you know, getting the numbers behind this unknown of being like, yeah, everybody wants this. Uh, prepare yourself to interview 30 to 60 people. Very important. I would say this is just to start. For companies that were at the accelerator, I think we had them for 10 people per week. And the most successful ones, you know, I think it, throughout the program, they would get to like 150, like in a span of three months, right? And you start kind of narrowing it down. It also depends for your business, right? If you actually have really specific business to really specific audience, you might not have such a big network, but you actually still got to interview those people that are there. If there are just four people doing what, you know, or have the problem that you're solving, you know, then it also kind of shows that there's probably not a market for that, right? And people would come, you know, a lot of times because going through customer discovery is not easy. They would come and it's like, well, you know, like, there's just not enough people that I can interview. And I'm like, well, then you don't have a business. Like how you want to convince me that you cannot find, you know, 100 people that are actually excited about your business that you can talk to about their problems, right? And then how you're actually going to sell to those people if you cannot even find them. <clears throat> this is more technical. Consider outsourcing, interview scheduling. Um, and then, as I mentioned, you know, a lot of times, a uh, small tip at the end of the interview, right? You ask, do you know somebody else that I can talk to, right? It's about those referrals. You start with your network. However, through the referrals, you get to a wider network. And always, always ask that, right? Because that's the only, it's not the only way, but it's a really efficient way of actually finding more people that you can talk to. And it's even better if they can make a personal introduction, right? <clears throat> So I would say you will have, we talked about the problem interview. Uh, this is kind of, you know, a little outline how you can actually do it. And then you have the solution interview. Once you figure out what is the problem that you're solving and you kind of design, you know, have in mind what is the, the solution that you're actually going to be providing to them, right? Two different things. All right. So what you can be using, you know, the first thing where you're going to be recording your findings all of times is the business model canvas, right? And you can have the interviews in an Excel spreadsheet. So ideally what you have, what you start with, get your business model canvas, write all your hypotheses that you have for all those boxes. Then you're going to go out, interview people, come back home, write it in small Excel spreadsheet, like where you can aggregate the data. And then after that, you're going to look into your business model canvas and ask, okay, what changed, right? What are the things that I thought were true but are not? And what the people actually said? <clears throat> mm, okay. A lot of times what we are using, it's, you know, it's kind of like, what, that's, is the hypothesis testing, right? What we thought this week, uh, you know, what are the insights, the most impactful insights that we actually gathered, and what's actually next? Uh, all right. So I think here are a couple of resources that uh, you can look into. If you are really planning on doing the interviews, Running Lean, uh, the book, really helpful. Um, a lot of our founders, you know, really liked it, and I believe, like, Pace uses for majority of their programs and things like that, so I'm pretty sure, um, you know, you can find it easily. And I think that's kind of it.